didn't even have to be told. You just sat down. <laughs> That's good. You got you trained. Yeah, laugh at my jokes. My mom's here today, so she'll be really upset if you don't laugh at my jokes. So, uh, Theodore Roosevelt is probably my favorite president of all time. Um, he just so interesting and kind of a manly man. Uh, he did a whole bunch of stuff, and there's a, there's a great trilogy of books on him by Edmund Morris. Uh, I would encourage you to read those if you're ever interested in the presidents. Uh, but one of the unique things about Theodore Roosevelt is he wasn't always the manly man. In fact, as a child, he was fairly physically weak. His mind was incredibly sharp. Uh, but as a child, he dealt uh, with frailty, a lot of sickness. Uh, he was asthmatic. And being born uh, during the Civil War, there wasn't like he could go get an inhaler you know, and, and solve that problem. And so his father came to him uh, one day and said, uh, Theodore, your mind is as strong as it can be, but your body is incredibly weak. And if y your mind is only going to go as far as your body will take it. And so unless you make your body something, you'll never become as great as you could be. And little Theodore said, I will make my body. It was probably more like, I will make my body. And he did. He began to work out. He began to do a series of calisthenics and push-ups and sit-ups and, and really just getting uh, into a physical rhythm, uh, so much so that he, was, uh, he entered boxing uh, tournaments when he was at Harvard. And one of his physicians at Harvard told him, you have to stop, you have to slow down, or your heart is going to give out. And Roosevelt's response to that was to go and climb the Matterhorn. Yeah, he didn't, didn't follow direction too well. But he was quoted as saying, I would rather my children die than grow up to be weaklings. We have a, a strong, I think especially as Americans and, and maybe even as Texans, we have a very strong visceral reaction to weakness. We don't like it. We don't like to admit to it. We don't want to show it. And I've had a lot of conversations with young people uh, that grew up in the Park Cities area. And they've even admitted that they feel like it is difficult having grown up in the Park Cities area, to show any weakness. Uh, they've told me that, that they feel like they have to put on a front, they have to put on a veneer, because they were raised, whether it was explicitly said or sort of implicitly uh, stated, that it's not okay for them to show weakness, to show authenticity, to show who they really are. And maybe you feel some of that pressure yourself, regardless of where you grew up. What happens in the family stays in the family, that kind of thing. We're strong, we're not weak. Maybe think about a weakness that you have, one that you're aware of, one that makes you a little nervous for it to be shown, one that if it were to be called out, you would be embarrassed or ashamed, something that maybe even your closest friends don't know. What are some weaknesses that you can think about? Are you discouraged by that? Are you discouraged by your limitations? Are you discouraged by the things you want to do but maybe can't do? because you're hampered by some physical malady or maybe something mental, maybe intellectual, educational, maybe it's something emotional. Maybe you're struggling with a, a mental illness today, and that's a weakness. That's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about how our weaknesses might actually become our strengths. And we're continuing on in this study of from death to life, looking at the resurrection and how the resurrection uh, not only puts death on its head, but it puts so many other things. It sort of requires us to live in an inverted world. As Christians, uh, we live in an upside-down kingdom where up is down and down is up, and our weaknesses are our strengths. Our grief can become joy. Our death can become life. We're going to be in 2 Corinthians 12, uh, verse 7, and this is probably a popular passage that many of you know. And we're going to be looking at our weaknesses, God's strength, and then what we do about it. So 2 Corinthians 12, 7, we'll go through verse 10. Starting in verse 7, we are weak. We are weak people. Verse 7, so to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Okay, so we're picking up Paul's sort of uh, a thought process, not just in the middle of the movie, but like way late in the movie. We're almost to the credits, okay? So Paul has had a lot of interaction with the Corinthian church. Uh, we, this is the second letter that we have that he's written to them, but most scholars think this is actually the fourth letter 
So this is probably 4th Corinthians uh, in, the, in the chronological sense, right? So we know about 1 Corinthians, and even 2 Corinthians here is a, is a book that maybe changed course halfway through. He maybe received some information as he was writing this letter to, him, to them, and about halfway through it changes its tone uh, as to how he's talking. And what has happened is he's founded this church in Corinth, and they've written and asked him some questions. He's answered the questions, and then he's begun to get word that some people came in that claim to be apostles like him, but now they're making fun of Paul. They're ridiculing Paul. They're, they're making fun of the way that he talks. They're making fun of the fact that he's not very powerful in presence, but when he writes his letters, he's very forceful. They're ridiculing the fact that he's not there. They're ridiculing the fact uh, that physically he's not very imposing. And, and Greeks really liked uh, flashy speakers. And so Paul was apparently not one of those. And so Paul writes them back in 2 Corinthians. It begins to, to support kind of his, his candidacy, his legitimacy as an apostle. And this starts in chapter 10. And so some of the things he lays out, he says his authority is from God. And this is chapter 10, uh, verse 7 through 8. He says he was the first to share Christ with them, chapter 11, uh, verses 2 through 4. He says he's superior in knowledge in verse 6. He says he doesn't accept money from them to support his ministry. That's 11, 7 to 15. He's undergone more trial than anybody. That's 11, 21 to 33. And then he has heavenly visions. He's had heavenly visions. He's been called up and seen things that no man has seen. Now, if I'm building this case, I'm probably going to land on the heavenly vision things. Maybe if I'm talking to Baptist, I'll put that first because that weirds us out a little bit. Maybe as a Pentecostal church, we go a little lower on that list. But in building his case, you would think that he would land the plane right there on the heavenly visions. Like, have these guys had heavenly visions? But that's not where he stops. He keeps going and he begins to talk about his weakness. He lands the plane by pointing them out, pointing them to a prominent weakness that not only the, that he's aware about, aware of, but they are probably also aware of it. And his detractors, the people that are coming in and ridiculing him, are also probably aware of it as well. So rather than covering up his weakness, he exposes it. He makes them aware of it. And this is a physical thorn. This is probably something physically in his flesh that, that is the problem. It's probably a physical ailment, uh, although there's some ideas about what that might be. But coupled with this physical ailment, notice it says in verse 7, a messenger of Satan to harass me. Now, I've always read this as the thorn and the messenger of Satan were the same thing. But a lot of what I read this week actually splits those up. So he has a physical weakness, and now Satan is coming in on top of it and ridiculing him for him making him feel insecure, making him doubt, making him frustrated, attacking him through the weakness, which is often how our weaknesses show up, right? We have something we can't do, and then we get all insecure about it. We get all touchy about it, right? Now, we're not really sure what the physical thorn is. It could be a bunch of different things, and you'll see some of them on the screen here. It could be epilepsy. He could have suffered with seizures. It could have been hysteria, depression, a kind of headache or eye trouble. There's some people that think uh, at one point in one of his letters, he says, see how, what big letters I write with my hand? Some people think he, he wrote largely because he couldn't see. Some people think it's malaria or leprosy. I think that's less likely, but a possibility. Some may say he has a speech impediment, and he's frustrated by it because a lot of what he does is public speaking. Could be dealing with temptations or anxiety or the stress of a missionary life. You know what's great about this passage? We don't know. And we talk a lot about it. Like, you, you sit around a table and be like, what do you think Paul's thorn is? And we talk about it. But it's great that we don't know. Why is it great that we don't know? Because Paul is one of, if not the greatest Christian of all time. And it is not beyond the realm of belief to think that maybe he struggled with the same thing that I struggle with. His weakness is the same weakness as mine. And God, in his sovereignty, left that open so that we can identify with the passage here in 2 Corinthians. Because we all have weaknesses. We all have limitations. We all have things that we're not good at. We all have things we can't do, things we can't accomplish, whether it's a physical weakness, whether it's an emotional weakness, mental weakness. All have things that we can't do that we're not good at. And the people around us are aware of them as well, right? And it's reasonable to think that like Paul, our weaknesses might be there to keep us from becoming too conceited, too sure of ourselves. Notice it says in verse 7, so to keep me from, to, from becoming conceited, B, 
Because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, and then he repeats it, to keep me from becoming conceited. The problem in our culture is we're really specialized, right? The job you do is probably so specific that you don't actually encounter your weakness very often. Your job is probably geared towards your strengths. And so you go into a place that you spend most of your time in during the week, and you know what happens? You don't encounter your weakness very much. And so you become convinced of yourself. You become sure of yourself because your weaknesses are somebody else's job on the line, right? Somebody else handles that problem, right? Like one of my big weaknesses in my job is I'm not very administratively gifted. If anybody's worked with me, they know this. It's not news. I, don't, I can't cover that one up, sadly. But I have an assistant, and she helps me with that. And so a lot of my administrative deficiencies I don't run into as much because I have someone that helps me. And it can lead to, maybe it has, me becoming more convinced of myself. And that's not a bad way to run the world, being specialized. That's fine. What it's not good for is it's not good for our humility if we don't encounter our weaknesses. And like I said, Paul uses this, or sorry, Satan uses this thorn of Paul's to attack him, to go after him. And we also face those insecurities and that torment over our weaknesses. We're often terrified of being exposed, looking like we need help. We're afraid to seem incompetent or to not look like, look like we know what we're doing. Some of y'all came back from uh, spring break. You went skiing over spring break. I've never skied in my life. I don't intend to start. You know why? I just don't want to look like an idiot. I don't want to fall down. That's, that's probably reason number one, right? It's a weakness of mine. I'm, I'm going to stay off the slopes. I didn't grow up in a cold climate. I'll leave that from others. But we run away from things. When, when our weakness becomes sort of confronted or there's a possibility that our weakness might be exposed, we run away. We might run away from a new job because it would ask us to do something new that maybe we're not quite used to. Maybe we run away from our families. We hide from them because we're not really sure what to do with a toddler or a preteen or a teenager. And so dads or moms, you, you're uncomfortable because you're out of your element and so you just hide at work because there you're in control of everything. Or you start hiding from a spouse because she knows or he knows your weaknesses. But at work, there's somebody there that they don't know your weaknesses and they think you're amazing. Your wife, your spouse, your, your, your husband, they always seem to point out your weaknesses. That person at work, they don't really know. I don't know. They think I'm really strong. And so we begin to become infatuated with somebody. Trying to cover up our weaknesses can be very dangerous. It can lead to all sorts of devastating things. We hide from new opportunities to maybe go to South Texas or Guatemala or Cambodia because that's for other people to do. That's not us. I don't really travel, you know. And what we do in the midst of all this, we, we start playing it safe and we become convinced that we're living the good life. When really what the good life is, is just this watered down version that's oriented all around me and my strengths and what I'm good at. And if I'm not good at it, I don't bother thinking about it. It's an amputated way to live. But now, every now and again, we occasionally, occasionally begin to address our weaknesses. And that's typically around New Year's, right? We develop some resolutions that last about two months. But we start to fight against our weaknesses. We fight against our weaknesses. Look at verse 8. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. Paul is insistent that his weakness goes away. He implores God to take this weakness away, this limitation, and the word here for go away or to, to leave him is the aposte, which is the Greek word where we get the, the term apostasy or apostasize. And if you're not familiar with that word, uh, if somebody is a believer and then they reject all of the things of the faith, they've committed apostasy. They've rejected it. They've left the faith. They've gone away. And so Paul is using this word to be like he wants his thorn, this weakness, this physical problem to just disappear, to go away. Doesn't want to work on it. Doesn't want to fight through it. Just want it to leave, to go away, to depart. Now, why does he want God to take this weakness away? Well, he actually tells us. In chapter 10, verse 15, he says, We do not boast beyond limit in the labors of others, but our hope is that as your faith increases, our area of influence among you may be greatly enlarged, so that we may preach the gospel in lands beyond you. 
without boasting of work already done in another's area of influence. Paul wants to get on with the work. Paul has a dream, and his dream is that the gospel will go even farther than it's already gone. Bigger and better and grander, and he's at the tip of the spear. He wants it to go to Rome, and he wants it to go to Spain, and he wants it to go all over the world. That's what Paul wants. And whatever this physical thorn is, it's keeping him from doing what he wants to do. It's keeping him from doing what he thinks God is calling him to do. And so he's like, Lord, take this away. If you would just take this away, I could get going. We could really move this gospel thing along, right? We hate our weaknesses the same way that Paul hated his, and we hate our weaknesses the same way Teddy Roosevelt hated his as well. At times, we want them to just go away. We just want it to go away. We don't want to work on it. We don't want to try and overcome it. We just want to wake up one day and it's gone. Kind of like Spider-Man, right? He got bit by the radioactive spider. He goes from skinny nerd type guy to all of a sudden acrobatic, super strong. That's what we want. We want to get bit by the radioactive spider. Maybe not. Some of y'all like spiders now. And we just want to wake up and things are gone. It's over. We don't have to deal with it anymore. Or we beg God to do something about it. Because we're like Paul. Paul recognizes the good of the thorn. He knows it's to keep him from being conceited. But he still says, Lord, take this away. Like, I get the purpose, but I want this to go away. And we do the same thing. We're like, Lord, I understand that I can't be good at everything. Or, God, I understand that you work through people's weaknesses. But can't you just work through my strengths? Like, can't you just do your work and make me look good doing it too? Because that whole weakness thing, that's for other people. That's for other people that have flaws, that have difficulty. And if I just didn't have this one thing, I would be amazing. Oh, and God, you would be amazing too. Side note, right? Whether it's an illness that's changed our lifestyle or some emotional pain or a past experience, we understand intellectually that God wants to work this way. But like I said, that's for other people who aren't me. And then sometimes we just try to eradicate the weakness ourselves. Again, like Teddy Roosevelt, we, we get our willpower going, we make a New Year's resolution, and we start working. And there's all sorts of things that we can do. We look at what we might, might accomplish, and so maybe the weakness is a physical limitation that maybe we can do something about. Like, let's say you're sensitive to losing, losing weight. Let's say that's a good example. And so you start to work to lose weight because you see that as a weakness. Maybe your doctor said something to you about your health based on your weight. And so you start working through it, and you're like, man, think of all the things that I could accomplish, and you use that as a motivator. It's not a bad thing. We make resolutions. We go see professionals. So maybe if it's a mental illness, you see a counselor or a therapist. We go through procedures, maybe. Maybe if there's something about our physical appearance that we feel really insecure about, we go and see a surgeon about it, get that fixed. We go back to school. Maybe we get an education, right? We're nervous about uh, a, a job that we might be able to get, and so we go back to school. And all the time we're doing this, all the time we're fighting against our weakness, there's still that voice, right, hanging out back there. Hey, what if this doesn't work? What if you're still a loser after you do all this? What if you find something else to be insecure about? What if everybody still laughs at you? What if, what if, what if? And either we believe the voice or we lose that vision of what we might be able to do and we quit. And do you know what happens to our weaknesses when we quit? They either keep hanging around or they get stronger or we lose all the ground we made up. We fight against our weaknesses, but here's the problem. We are not infinitely strong. So for a season, I can do things. Like for a season, again, I talked about my administrative inability. For a season, I could focus on that and probably be really good. I could, I could schedule things really well, answer emails really promptly. I mean, I could be an administrative giant. But because that's not in my wheelhouse, it's not my strength, it's one of those things that We'll begin to slip. I'll get distracted by things that I'd rather be doing. And I'll fall back out of practice, out of habit. You have a limited amount of strength to apply to fixing your weaknesses. And people have gathered this. People have learned this. That's why your job plays more towards your strengths than your weaknesses. Because your job doesn't want to pay for you to figure out your weaknesses. 
They want you to do what you're good at. And that's not a bad thing to do. But again, it doesn't help our humility. It doesn't help our humility. So no matter what we face, no matter what weakness or limitation you deal with, maybe it's one we've talked about, maybe it's one we haven't, maybe the one that you can think of I haven't mentioned. But God can use that weakness for his glory and for your good. God can use that weakness for his glory and your good. He can strengthen us to do something grander than we can imagine because God strengthens us. God strengthens us. Look at verses 9 and 10. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Let's stop there. So after Paul's repeated pleas that God would do something to take away this problem, God finally answers him. The Lord finally answers him. And I don't know if this was in one of the visions that he was having or if this was an audible voice. In my Bible, it's in red letters. So I'm assuming that that it was an audible voice of some kind. And God tells him two things. He says what? My grace is sufficient for you and my power is made perfect in weakness. Those two things are what he says. Now, let's look at both of those kind of clauses. My grace is sufficient for you. God is telling Paul that he's going to supply him with enough grace and enough power to live, to bear up underneath whatever this weakness is that he has. He's not taking it away, and he's not going to give him so much grace and power that he's able to just go on with life and not feel it anymore. God's not going to give him so much grace that he doesn't, he's just numb to it. No, he's going to feel it every day. It's going to hurt. It's going to bother him. But God is going to give him enough grace to accomplish the things that God wants him to accomplish despite the pain and the physical ailment. He's going to get enough grace to hold up under it. Now, frequently in our churches, when we talk about grace, what you think of is the grace that saves, right? Unmerited favor necessary for salvation. That's what we think of. And that's a good thing to think of. That's not a bad thing. That's that's a primary thing, right? But grace is also something else. Grace is a sustaining force or power that holds us up in victory and in defeat, in strength and in weakness. In John 15, 5, Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. It's not some things. It's not occasional things. It's not during the week you can do things, but on the weekend you need me. He says nothing, no thing, no thing that you can do, right? We don't often take that literally, but I want you to stop and I want you to think about the fact that you're breathing right now. It's an involuntary thing that you do. You just breathe on your own. It's great. Every single breath you take, every move you make, everything you do is sovereignly allowed or permitted by God. Those breaths you're taking are breaths willed by God for you to take. And if God should will that you take no more breaths, no matter how healthy or happy you are, guess what? There are no more breaths, should it be God's will. God's grace is sufficient to hold us up because it has to be. If God's grace isn't powerful enough to strengthen us, to hold us up under the crushing weight of our failures, limitations, and weaknesses, then there's nothing that's going to fix that. There's nothing else. There's no plan B. It's God's grace or nothing. Grace is the thing that motivates God to even want anything to do with us because we're his enemies. When we commit sin, when when we've broken fellowship with God, we now become his enemies. Now, typically, what do we do to our enemies? We go to war. We fight, right? Not God. He redeems. He rescues. And when you put your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ, you no longer are his enemies. You become his friend. You become his adopted child. That's what we sang about. His grace is sufficient to overcome our ultimate weakness, that of sin. And if it can overcome that weakness, it can overcome any weakness that you have. Then he says, my power is made perfect in weakness. You should ask two questions. What kind of power is he talking about, and what does it mean to be made perfect? Let's talk about that power. This is the power that the Father exhibits through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's specifically what's being talked about here, okay? Today we're on Palm Sunday, so hold up your hand. It's Palm Sunday. You're welcome. It's Palm Sunday. 
And today we remember Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. He's just resurrected Lazarus from the dead, or raised him from the dead. And everybody is hearing about it, thinks it's awesome. And he's got this whole posse. It's a mob of people just there singing praises, calling him the salvation of mankind. I mean, he is, he is at the, the peak of his popularity and power and strength. And by the end of the week, he'll be murdered and dead. And he'll be abandoned by every single one of those people that are there. Because it wasn't through the strength of the Messiah that God chose to save. It was through his weakness. It was through fragile humanity. Now, it was important for the Son to be divine. It was also important for the Savior to be human, to experience weakness, to walk amongst weakness, to look weakness in the face every day, to be tempted, to be weak, to, to pray in the Garden of Gethsemane, Lord, not my will but yours, but take this cup from me. He had to experience that in order to be a savior for us. This apparent weakness, fragile humanity. It is not through strength that we become strong. It is through weakness. It is through weakness that God has imparted strength to us. And this strength is the strength that has overcome sin, death, and evil. And if it can overcome those things, I don't care what your weakness is. I guarantee you God is powerful enough to overcome that too, to work through that for his glory and for your good. He might not take it away. He might not remove it. You might not wake up one day and it be gone. It might happen. But I think more than likely, it's something where you'll be, receive enough grace and power to bear up under it. And that's what it means by be made perfect. The power of God is made manifest to the world around us in our weaknesses. The Lord's answer to Paul and him passing this answer on to us is that his plans are often accomplished by us being weak. You see it time and time again in Scripture. Abraham's age. Abraham was old. He was too old to be having kids. And God promises him a son. And then it's not that son, actually. You're going to have another one. Sarah was barren, his wife. Couldn't have children. And in her 90s, guess what? She has a son. Jacob, who's Abraham's grandson, was a liar, a cheat, and a thief. He had a weakness for a scheme, for a plan. And God uses him. He becomes the father of Israel. He changes his name to Israel, and he fathers 12 children. Israel becomes slaves. Slavery is a weakness. A nation of slaves becoming the chosen people of God. What? That's exactly what God does. David's a shepherd, and he's the youngest. He's a menial profession, and he's going to become king. God works through weakness. David's an adulterer. He has affairs, and he's a murderer, and God still uses him because it is through David that Jesus Christ is born. It's through his line, and then Daniel is exiled. One of the most worshipful, godly men in all of Scripture doesn't really live in Jerusalem where he's supposed to worship, but somehow maintains a thriving spiritual life in exile. Our weaknesses, the one that Satan's kind of on you about all the time, the one that you feel super insecure, the one that you're thinking about right now, maybe it's a sin, maybe it's some brokenness, maybe it's a past, maybe it's a present, maybe it's future, maybe you're just worried about the future. Whatever your weakness is, God is able to use those things maybe even more than your strengths, for his glory and for your good. It doesn't mean you shouldn't seek to improve. It doesn't mean you shouldn't seek to overcome some of those weaknesses or fight that temptation that you have. It does mean that those same weaknesses that embarrass you or frighten you or that you try to cover over, those are just as capable of bringing glory to God as your strengths are. And so Paul gets on board with it. Notice what he says in verse 10. For the sake of Christ, then I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. That word strength there is a political strength. It means influence. So when I'm weak, then I'm at my greatest influence. What did Paul want to do? In chapter 10, he says, I want the influence to expand. I want to go beyond 
the influence that I have. So what he realizes is the vehicle through which God is going to expand the gospel in Europe is through his weakness. So when I'm weak, then I'm at my best influence. I'm at my height. The goal of making Christ known in the world. So what do you do? What are your weaknesses going to do for the kingdom of God? What are you going to do with them? You need to embrace your weakness. Embrace your weakness. How do you do that? One, you need to admit that you have limitations. There's a good place to start. We all know you do. We all know you have weaknesses. Your spouse knows, probably is most aware. Your kids know. Your job knows. I guarantee you your dog knows. I'm sorry, but he knows too. Admit that there are things in your life that you're just not good at or things that you're struggling with. They might be a sin. It might not be. Many of our weaknesses aren't. It's just something you're not good at. And for whatever reason, we we try and cover over it. Stop trying to hide them and own up to them. Here's what I want you to do with this this week. If you live live with your family, I want you guys to sit down at dinner. If if you're, you're a single adult, I want you to get together with some friends that are close, some believers. Maybe call your family. Do a phone tree or whatever. And I want you to sit down, and I want each of you to admit one thing that you're not good at. One weakness. And when each person goes, the rest of the family, I want to look at that person and say, one, we know. Two, but we love you and we're proud of you. Now, it might feel wooden to to say that, but hearing that, some of your kids have been longing to hear that for a long time. And those are the very things that the Lord would say to you as well. Son, daughter, I know, I love you, and I'm proud of you. And hearing that on the lips of another believer can be really powerful for you to begin taking steps to allowing God to work through those weaknesses. So admit that you have limitations. Two, come to Christ with your weakness. Come to Christ with your weakness. Your ultimate weakness, like I said, is the brokenness that's been imparted to you by sin. And there's nothing anybody in this room can do to fix it, and there's nothing anybody... Uh, in this room can do to fix it for themselves, okay? You can't get stronger and overcome the permanent brokenness of sin. That has to be something that is done by Jesus Christ. So you have to go to him and you have to admit your weakness, which I know is very hard for us to do. But you have to come before the Lord and say, God, I am powerless before the fact that I am a broken person. There are things I'm not good at. It takes humility There's never been a proud man saved by the gospel, ever. It has to be an act of humility coming before the Lord because he died, was buried, and was resurrected, and that was humiliating. The Son of God, King of kings, Lord of lords, led away naked, crucified, buried, and then finally resurrected in glory. We have to go the same way. We are not better than our Master. We have to become exposed. We have to show ourselves who we are to our king and say, Lord, this is what I am, and I need you to accept me because I want to accept you. And he will. He will. Next thing you need to do is you need to join with other weak people. You need to come together with other weak people. Nothing says I'm weak like coming around with a bunch of other people and say I need help. My guess is one of the reasons why you haven't joined a connect group if you're not in one is because you don't think you need it. That's for those people that need it. I'm going to let you in on a little secret. You need it too. And maybe nobody in your life is brave enough or bold enough to tell you that or, or you just don't listen when they do. But if somebody has told you that you need a connect group, guess what? They're right and you're wrong. And you've got a weakness right there. You're blind to your need. You need to join our church, maybe. Same thing, it's just a bigger concept. Come around community. Join with us. And you know what? Hey, maybe we're weak. Maybe we need you. If that gets you here, great. I'll let the Lord work from there. Heck, join with your family. Stop being so cut off and removed from your family. I know, like, I have a a 19-month-old. She's scary. She's terrified. I don't know what to do with her. At the end of the day, I'm just exhausted, and I put her in the bed, and I'm like, just go to sleep, please. Daddy needs a break. But most of us, when we don't know what to do at home, we do this. 
and we ignore our family. Put your phone down and engage your family. Engage the people around you. I watched a commercial recently. It's an AT&T commercial, and this mom is sitting there watching Game of Thrones, and many of you know how I feel about that. It's evil. I'm sitting there watching Game of Thrones, and two, her two daughters come in, and they're arguing, and they're wanting mom to solve a problem. And the next scene is her going in the bathroom, locking the door, climbing in the bathtub, and continuing to watch her show. That's funny. It's cute. But you know what that does? It begins to, to tell us that it's okay to escape when we're needed. And it's a subtle hint. And yes, parents, yeah, sometimes we've got to get away. I'm down with that. But if your child or your family is in the room, don't just stay on your phone the whole time. Engage them. It used to be the TV that we stayed on. Now it's our phones. Maybe come serve with us at PCBC. Come join with us in an area that maybe you do feel a little weak, like children's ministry or preschool. Maybe greet people. Maybe you're not somebody that likes to smile and greet people. I get it, but greet them anyway. Maybe on Easter Sunday, move to a lesser ser- attended service. Move to 915. And then lastly, watch as Christ works through your weakness. You know what's really cool about this is I can't tell you what's going to happen. I can't tell you when you do all these things, you admit your weakness, you confess it to other people, and you, you begin to trust the Lord to kind of work through it. I can't tell you how or what he's going to do. For Paul, it was very specific. For you, it will be very specific. But here's what I can promise you. It will be amazing. And you will be glad that you did. And it will be healing and restorative for you. I promise that. We're all weak. Stop trying to act like you're not, because we are. And we try to overcome our weaknesses, and that's fine. As long as you recognize that God can work through those weaknesses just as much as he can work through your strengths, and he's going to strengthen you for his purposes, for his glory, and for your good. And then just embrace your weakness. Be comfortable with it. Don't let Satan use that as a way to make you feel insecure about who God has made you to be. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for today, for your grace to us, Lord, and the fact that even in the midst of the fact that we are weak and fragile human beings, that we are a moment from death and destruction, you have delivered us. You have brought us out of the pit. And so maybe, maybe today, Lord God, you need, uh, you want, you desire us Maybe there's people in this room that need to join the church or join a connect group or or just answer some questions, God. Maybe there's some weakness that they want to confess and talk to, Lord God. I pray that you would bring them uh, to our next steps room. Lord God, I ask that you would work in our hearts throughout the week, that you would remind us of our weakness, not in an accusing way because that's not how you work, but in a way that pushes us to you and makes us desirous of you and, and gives us hope in a way that we can hold up others as well as be held up by you. And so, Lord God, I look forward to how you're going to work. I look forward to what you might do. We pray all this in your son's name. Thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. If you would like more information about our church or following Jesus, please go to our website, pcbc.org, or contact our church offices. We hope to see you next week at church.